We're delighted to welcome you all to the first ever Degra India conference. Last year, when we began our journey in November with a small close-knit group of game enthusiasts under the banner Game Studies India Adda, none of us imagined that our initiative will organically grow so quickly, especially in the midst of the pandemic. Today, we are proud to announce that within a year, we've managed to organize more than 20 talks, record about eight podcasts, and built a community of game enthusiasts with more than 100 members. None of this would have been possible without the mentorship of Dr. Shovik Mukherjee, who dared to dream of a game studies collective and brought us together. All our initiatives are primarily curated by students and, on, and early career scholars and professionals. Recently, we began our journey as the Indian chapter of Digital Games Research Association, and we are extremely grateful for the support we have received from them. Our conference this weekend is a product of months of hard work, and none of this would have happened without the dedicated efforts of our core committee. They voluntarily worked round the clock to envision this, develop call for papers, and coordinate all conference-related activities. We thank the reviewers for their valuable time, they helped us maintain the academic integrity of our conference by meticulously peer reviewing the abstracts received. Finally, we are extremely grateful to the Degra India community whose enthusiasm and support inspires us to work towards such initiatives. We hope you enjoy this conference. We have an insightful line of, of paper presentations today and a very exciting keynote address by Meghna Jayant. Just a few things to keep in mind. Please keep yourselves on mute during the presentation. You can engage with the presentations using the chat box. Feel, please feel free to post your questions and comments there. We would like to thank Digra once again for the support, support and encouragement it extended to us. Please keep in mind that this conference strictly abides by the Digra guidelines and upholds it, its commitment to principles of ac academic freedom, equality of opportunity, human dignity, and diversity and in inclusivity. We wish to reiterate that commitment to diversity and inclusiv inclusivity is a shared responsibility among all DGRA members so that we can create safer spaces and better practices that move beyond academic traditions of exploitation and exclusion. I would now like to invite Dr. Shodik Mukherjee to say a few words. Um, thank you, Isha. It, will, it is an honor to be uh, actually speaking at the first ever Digra India conference. It is like speaking inside uh, in, in one of my dreams, really. Uh, I, I never, if you ever have the opportunity of speaking in a dream that has come true, then you'll know how I'm feeling. So I started, uh, I, I was the lone researcher uh, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, I wrote my first paper on game studies called Alice, An Alice Played a Video Game uh, in, in 2001. And um, I had uh, some very hostile responses and some very positive ones. The positive ones were mostly from my peers. Uh, and I didn't know that uh, this was even worth kind of doing. But uh, here we are. And uh, for I, when, I, when I left India and I kind of did my PhD abroad and then came back, I came back with the, with the one sole mission of kind of uh, starting game studies in India. And over the years, with kind of a lot of uh, struggle that I've faced, a lot of resistance, a lot of struggle, I've actually managed to teach game studies in a place like Presidency University, formerly Presidency College and Hindu College, like one of the most kind of, uh, uh, well, traditional and, and, and uh, most kind of conservative uh, uh, academies, really. And uh, I, I mean, I was just kind of posting yesterday that uh, eight years back, I was teaching Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl in Presidency, projecting it on a wall with my own personal projector, extremely grainy, and then kind of uh, with a lot of resistance, people were just wondering what, what were you doing? And uh, it just it seems to have worked out that there are uh, now 100 members uh, in kind of this community. There are so many people. I can count 35 people right now, kind of, uh, even at this rather early hour on a Saturday morning who are uh, here. So this is uh, really great. It's, it's a matter of pride for me that this has actually happened. 
and it's like it's like uh, playing it's it's like a video game basically it's it's video game studies in india reloaded and uh, i hope that you will keep reloading it again uh, you will keep saving this memory this to your memories and reloading again f5 and f6 continually and uh, i hope you will play it in different ways uh, even when i'm gone uh, i hope that there will be there will be kind of you know uh, more interest in video games and uh, it'll also reach the the more serious the more uh, let's let's also say the more funded echelons of academia and uh, and culture and and uh, what 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 have you so all the very best more power to digra india and uh, uh, well we start off with the conference 2021 i hand over to uh, the the chair of this uh, upcoming session uh, jeffrey fernandez well thank you for the kind words uh, hello everyone welcome to day 1 of the digra conference titled philosophy and psychology of games so for our first panel we have three speakers out of whom the first one i'll be calling right now uh, a little bio about our first presenter anshuman datta is currently a postgraduate student in his first year at jadavpur university pursuing ma in english he has a deep interest in the cultural aesthetics and impact of video games so today he will be presenting a paper called the urban height of space the sublime outer worlds we welcome you to present thank you just let me share the screen first is it visible yes you are visible okay. according to immanuel kant the state of the sublime is the encounter of the ego with an overwhelming and unfathomable force of nature threatening possible annihilation and the reassertion of the self in the face of such chaos a possible source for this sublime can be while looking at the endless horizon from the top of a mountain like in caspar friedrich's 1818 painting wanderer above the sea of fog or by other events in nature like mountains and storms in a quick study of the british sublime the feelings invoked on seeing the alps would come up a number of times christian battersby states sublime as something that is characterized by awe reverence respect and dread in the face of the infinite or the indefinitely great and powerful in the sublime the artist marvels at that which stands at the boundaries of human identity and threatens to overcome it the question then becomes is this sense of sublime possible in video games video games are virtual constructs specifically designed by humans to be consumed by others it is as far as possible from where kant exclusively posits the sublime to be in nature in this technological realm a player is provided with a limited sense of agency and a digital avatar to interact with the game world acting almost as an extension of the body and mind the construct of a video game takes one of kant's conditions for experiencing the sublime a distant uh, distanced observer the object is not sublime in itself but is it is the interaction of the self with the object and the gap in between which ev evokes the sublime one is reminded of the first mission in metal gear phantom pain the big bt in death stranding dahaka in prince of persia or the particular mission of crossing a field of dead bodies in plague innocence as examples of moments that would fill the viewer with dread but a certain pleasure because they are not themselves in the game the possibility of immersion at the mo moment of chicken sen mihai's flow where a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits is a call in a collision of pleasure and pain makes it possible for the player to experience this sublime provided the developers have been careful to make it so the central tenet of movies digital's 2019 outer wilds is the notion of camping in space this is heavily emphasized in the poster of the game the screen of the menu the starting point of each gameplay and the main ending of the game the idea of sitting beside a campfire roasting a marshmallow and at times playing an instrument connects each of these events the player is an unnamed astronaut on the day of their first launch into space the game provides the player with a contained solar system to explore with five planets all going around the sun the player henceforth known as the traveler in the game follows the space steps of five others before them part of the outer worlds ventures who had already left to scour the solar system looking for adventure and answers 
Once aboard the spaceship, which feels more like a glorified tin box lander, the player can roam around the solar system. There is no linear way at approaching the game. Players can visit any planet they want to, in any order they feel like. The general aim would be to collect information and slowly piece together the narrative. In taking a heuristic approach, the developers also ensure that the players have to learn the basic mechanics and rules of the game. The players are left without any clear-cut clues, and the only way to learn seems to be by doing something, failing, repeating till one gets it right. It is only when the player gets up in space, and gently floating and looking around, that the first sense of dread and the sublime slowly descends onto the player. The protagonist is part of a species that have barely mastered the basics of space flight. They joke about the crashing and burning of the spaceship, and yet the player is aboard it, separated from a sea of nothingness by merely a few inches of aluminium. You are intentionally dwarfed and made to feel almost powerless against the terrifying vacuum and the unknowable vastness of space. Each planet of Outer Wilds is uniquely built to evoke the sense of awe and even terror which Burke associated with the supply <clears throat> within the players. Brittle Hollow is in fact a hollow planet with a volcanic moon. The moon spews out rocks that are crashing onto the planet's surface, slowly breaking it and pushing it into the black hole that is at the center of the planet. The hourglass twins are binary planets connected by a column of sand that seesaws between the planets, thus the hourglass effect. One of the scariest moments in the game has been when one encounters the sand column. Visually, it is massive, and the sound bellows and breaths into the ear as the falling sand sweeps the player off their feet and throws them to the other planet. In Giants Deep, once players get through the murky atmosphere, they are greeted with tumultuous seas, raging tornadoes, and little islands that they have to explore. Okay, this one doesn't have a, uh, any audio associated with it, so it's fine. Periodically, the tornadoes, which move around, by the way, will throw these islands, along with the player, up into the sky. For the first time, it is sure to catch the player unaware, as they suddenly find themselves shot upwards and then free-falling with the whole island. The scariest part of the game resides in Dark Bramble, the remnants of a planet infected from within by a vine-like growth. Within this planet, in a milky space and an eerie sound, resides some anglerfish. All you can see is their little light bulb before they eat you because you made too much noise. Information regarding these events is clarified in different parts of the solar system with the Nomai rooms and their conversations. And yet, the purest sense of the sublime that one can experience within outer wilds is the end of the time loop, as the end times begin to play. For the first time, it is a bewildering event for the players to experience. They are trying to make sense of a world that is not really helping them, when nature is uncompromising and mistakes are severely punished. At the 22 minutes mark in the loop, the sun, which will be growing bigger and turning redder all the while, will shrink in size, turn down, and go supernova. Pardon? Shall I stop? Okay. Uh, turn and go supernova, exploding and killing everyone.
The first time it happened for me, I let out a little yell, unsure what to make of it before I woke up again at the campfire. With each occurrence, the sense of the dread lessened. Even though the time loop meant I am not technically dying, I had to hurry and complete whatever I was doing so I don't have to come back there again next time. And yet, this event of unbridled chaos that I had no mastery over evoked a subtle sense of pleasure. The constant chance of failure, repetition, and death destabilizes the gamer by problematizing their relationship with the object that is the game. Repetition here is instituted both in nature, that is supernova, and, the, and by the actions performed by the players each time and the differences in them. The failures and repetitions, according to Jay Chu, adds to the experience of play and ensure more engagement from the player. It is a punishment given out when the player fails, dying from crashing against something, falling down, eaten by the angle of fish, cracking their visor, running out of time. The punishment is thus a source of both pain and pleasure, harking to the Burkean of life. For the final part of the playthrough of Outer Wilds, I would like to draw attention to the, to the essay by Barbara Bolt, titled The Technos of Life. This kind of sublime differs from the Kantian notion by the simple fact, according to Bolt, that there is not a reassertion of self while facing great peril, but rather dissolution of the boundaries of the self, the subjective self-I dissolving into the collective techno experience. Her essay is based heavily on Ben Malbon's 1999 study, Clubbing, Dancing, Ecstasy, and Vitality, and his subsequent diary entries. Bolt quotes Malbon writing in his diary, 4 a.m., lost for words, lost in time and space, just lost. We all seek to want the music to take us over, to become us in some way. Clubbers were losing it all over the place. People are just so close to each other, proximately and emotionally. The intensity of this fusion of emotions and emotions was almost overwhelming. Bolt states, this diary entry in particular speaks of an experience in which his sense of identity and rationality is subsumed in the experience. What Bolt connects with a sublime in a study of techno sublime is the nature of clubbing and dancing. I use the same understanding when looking at Outer Wilds' notion of camping. The choice of the instruments, drums, banjo, flute, harmonica, reflects the developer's idea of camping in space. The tapestry of the game's story is filled with planets weaving their own distinct music aligned to their aesthetics. Andrew Perlow, the creator of the pieces, talks at length about using folk instruments and simple campfire melodies to evoke a sense of nostalgia, a callback to games that, did, uh, games that used simple motives. Whereas elsewhere for the nomads who talk through their technology, he said, and I quote, I wrote a melody and textures to resemble a piano being ripped apart in space. Each of the members of the Outer Wilds ventures have an instrument they play that the players can hear through a signal scope in space. Each of the instruments in the game is playing a variation of the same song that gets pieced together at the end, titled Travelers, a commentary on the theme of connection and making meaning out of the parts. The gestalt of the video game encompasses all the different tunes that you have come across in your gameplay. The player gathers all the travelers around the campfire among the woods in a dreamscape, which transcends life and death. The end game is already triggered by them. The player goes around asking each one to play for one last time. You ask each of them separately, and as they start, the whole of the theme comes into play.
Bolt alludes to A Star and the 1992 music in the mind in saying that the power of the music, particularly when combined with other emotive elements such as the light, heat, beat, and rhythm of bodies and mass, can be terrifyingly impressive. Place we just saw out of bounds of space and time is akin to what Malbon says. Space itself, which fleetingly seems as though it has no edges, no end in time or space, yet at the same time only stretches of as far as you can see into the lights, the black walls. In the eye where the player is at the end, whatever they are seeing does not exist. The identity of the player is subsumed into this collective performance. The player becomes the conductor of their music's piece. The final performance of the music in the game is beyond time or space, existing just within itself. There is no more failure or repetition to deal with or trigger. It is an absolute action that will irreversibly lead to death and life. This pleasure upon pain, the nature of a simple celebration of life with friends made along the way against the background of impending annihilation of everyone involved, invokes both the sense of supply. The self comes face to face with its own, no longer merely possible, but absolute annihilation. The player in the swan song is not a detached observer, but an eager participant, the one who coaxes the action to take place. Barbara Freeman points out that there is an internal contradiction present in the Kantian sublime, since the very nature of the sublime experience involves a blurring of the distinction between the observer and the observant, and, and contradicts the supports, supposed detachment of the sublime encounter. The game has been a long and arduous journey of failure and repetition and death, which was just a reset. When the player takes apart the artifact that has been powering the time loop and then rushes through space accompanied by a haunting piece of melody trying to reach the Nomai spaceship deep within the dark brambles, that is when the realization dawns upon the player. One mistake will result in death with a capital emphasized D. It will be game over. But during the performance in the dreamscape, the player is now all but aware that their death is certain. In the performance, there is no longer a reassertion of the self, but resolution of it into a collective experience. If I may be so bold, the, intensity, the identity of the player in the real world is also overwhelmed by the collective existential threat and the loss of this moment. Numerous Reddit posts will support this statement. That Outer Wilds is a clever bit of, of the human design is by is of no doubt. It throws the player into an unforgiving, unknown, visually terrifying world bound with death at every step. But nature is not malevolent here. In Outer Wilds, there is no evil to fight and defeat, to combat, no skill points, no upgrades. The very nature of the gameplay is to induce that flow in the player where they can experience the sublime present within Outer Wilds. To figure out and posit this virtual sublime in a game is a difficult process. In games, we have the player, the player surrogate within the game, which is the game avatar and the game world. The relationship between these three plays out in the gamescape and gives rise to the sense of sublime. In Outer Wilds, this is achieved through its out world design and gameplay mechanics. It is a game of exploration and curiosity marked with, his, with this sublime aesthetics and the grand horror experienced visually and orally about life and death and everything in between. Thank you.
Thank you, Anshman, for that presentation. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of this uh, panel session. So please keep that in mind. Uh, with that, we'd like to move on to our second speaker for today. Uh, a little bio about them. Uh, Samuel Poirier Poulin is a PhD candidate in film studies at the University de Montreal, specializing in the study of video games and gaming cultures. His doctoral research investigates trauma in horror video games and draws on effect theory, phenomenology, and theories of emotion. He also writes about comedy and queer masculinities. Samuel is a vice editor at Press Start and the director of Pika P, a reading, <coughs> uh, excuse me, a reading circle that works towards decentering game studies. We'd like to welcome you, Samuel. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, I'll share the screen. Um... Okay, so now you should be able to see the screen, right? Yeah, yes, it's visible. Okay, great. So I'll start. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Samuel Boyapulai. I'm very happy to be here today. I think it's very exciting that we have DIGRA India. So I'm very glad to be uh, able to participate to it. I will be talking about uh, video ludic trauma and uh, more specifically about trauma in the game Cry of Fear. Uh, before I start, I have some content warning. So I will be dealing with a lot of heavy topics. I will be talking about suicide, about depression, about horror, and there will also be some pictures with blood and gore. Uh, so that being said, let's get started. Since the 1990s, uh, trauma theory has been used in the humanities to better understand the cultural and psychological significance of trauma. Despite the vitality of trauma studies and the use of trauma theory to analyze uh, literature, photography, and cinema, Trauma theory is only starting to be used in game studies. So far, a few scholars have explored the use or design of games to cope with trauma, whereas others have analyzed the representation of traumatized protagonists or the use of the video game medium to generate empathy, guilt, or a feeling of powerlessness. Mukherjee and Pitchford have argued that players of military shooters like Call of Duty 4 can experience some of the symptoms of war trauma in a milder form, including disorientation, tension, fear of injury, and pressure to protect their teammates. Meanwhile, Smithers has analyzed how Limbo incorporates the symptomatology of trauma through its bleak graphics, its soundtrack made of disembodied sounds, and the numerous grisly death of the protagonist. As noted by Lockers, trauma seems to be worryingly transmissible. Uh, quote, sorry, quote, it links between uh, mental and physical symptoms, between patients, between patients and their, between uh, patients and doctors, and between victims and their listeners or viewers. Drawing on horror studies and using the video game Cry of Fear as a case study, this paper suggests that a video game can induce trauma in the player by putting them in horrifying and intense situation. While several horror games successfully, uh, successfully generate what Perron has called videoludic fear and push a player to play at frightening themselves, what the player experiences in Cry of Fear goes further and is closer to a form of trauma. I call it videoludic trauma. I define videoludic trauma as a disruptive experience that cuts across the reality fiction divide and deeply impacts on the emotional organization of the player. Following Tronstad, my work starts from the premise that video games can leave the player with strong impressions that continue to resonate in them long after the gameplay session is over. Cry of Fear tells the story of Simon Henriksen, a young man who wakes up in an alley and must find his way back home after a man voluntarily drove on him with a car. As the player progresses in the game, they discover that Simon is in a wheelchair following the incident and that the game is a metaphorical depiction of his trauma in his fight against his inner demons. While Cry of Fear generally follows the convention of the survival horror subgenre and requires a player to fight against monsters, solve puzzles, and manage their inventory, the game also contains a few surprising elements, notably monsters with fast and jerky movements, extremely graphic scenes, a confusing soundtrack, and first-person melee combat. Videoludic trauma is created by an environment that shocks and overwhelms the player and by a morbid reflection on solitude and suicide that reflects Simon's existential angst. As noted by Mortensen and Jorgensen, 
Research on video games with transgressive content has historically followed the tradition of media effects research. Up to this day, quote, provocative transgressive games remain framing a language of concern and protection, locking a deeper understanding of the process of reception, critical reading, and aesthetic appreciation, end of the quote. So with the understanding that research on horror and trauma share a common ground, this paper proposes a conceptualization of videoludic trauma in horror video games and in Cry of Fear in particular. It provides new analytical tools uh, and vocabulary to talk about our traumatic experiences with games. So in this paper, I take an aesthetic stance to conceptualize videoludic trauma and seek to distance myself from the narrow black or white definitions of trauma often proposed by clinical psychology. I start from the premise that all sad or tragic events have some shades of trauma, from thinking about death to suffering from loneliness or wondering about the meaning of life. On the one hand, I recognize that games affect people differently and that one's background and life traje trajectory, level of tolerance and previous experiences with games influence the way they experience video lived trauma, if they experience it at all. On the other hand, I, stre I stress that videoludic trauma is part of a design philosophy and is usually the result of a desire to generate deep emotions and to break with certain social norms or genre conventions. Of particular interest to my conceptualization of videoludic trauma is the concept of bleed as theorized in Nordic live action role playing, also known as LARP. Following Bowman, bleed consists in, quote, the blurring of the emotions, thoughts, physical state, and relationship dynamics of the player and the game character, end of the quote, leading to a reduction of the boundary between reality and fiction. For some players, bleed experiences can be very positive, notably when their emotions are synchronized with that of the character, generating strong moments of catharsis. In the case of Extreme LARP, more specifically, Hopi Ametsa and Montola have argued that games that produce an intense experience of horror and tragedy, sometimes leading players to cry or even experience physiological stress reaction, can generate what they call a positive negative experience. An experience that is not fun nor pleasurable, but that is still meaningful and provides in retrospect some satisfaction to the player. The idea that a form of trauma could be transmitted from a fictive character to the player seems especially appropriate to theorize LARP where the player interiorizes the emotions and the personality of the fictive character, and where the, notions of, the notion of performance is particularly strong. The situation is different with video games, and the concept of bleed must be interpreted in a broader sense. In video games, bleed no, does not blur the boundary between the life of the player and that of the character, but between the life of the player and what happens in the game world at large. As noted by Jagoda, Video games open up a new sensorium and afford the player a, quote, specific experience of speciality, temporality, speed, graphics, audio, and procedural activity, end quote. As Newman suggests, when playing video games, the player might not see themselves as the character they are playing, but might rather relate to the game as a whole. So now I would like to reflect on what I call impactful trauma and hurtful trauma, and then on the concept of horror flow. I define impactful trauma as a form of art trauma that is valuable to the game experience, provokes reflection, and has a narrative purpose. Impactful trauma is the result of game content that is disturbing and even distressing for the player, but with which the player is still willing to engage. On the other hand, hurtful trauma is a form of impactful trauma that has gone too far. Like impactful trauma, hurtful trauma is well-crafted in the gameplay and the game narrative but it overwhelms a player, does them violence, and leaves them with wounds that take time to heal. Whereas impactful trauma falls within transgressive aesthetics, hurtful trauma occurs when boundaries are overstepped and when a game segment challenges what the player is willing to endure. Hurtful trauma arguably has more transformative power than impactful trauma and might provide a better understanding of a certain situation, but it becomes costly for the player on the long term. Hurtful trauma is more intrusive and catharsis does not seem to be possible due to its presence. Games like Heavy Rain, Beyond Two Souls, and especially Papers, Please, led me to experience impactful trauma. On the other hand, 
The trauma I experienced while playing Cry of Fear was at time hurtful. Lastly, uh, drawing on Chikzen Mihai's theory of flow, I would like to introduce the concept of horror flow. According to Chikzen Mihai, flow occurs in situations where there is a fine balance between someone's skills and the challenges at hand, resulting in an optimal experience. Challenges that are too high for the skills of the participant will generate frustration and anxiety, and challenges that are too low will lead to boredom. In contrast, a fine balance between the challenges and the skills create the flow channel where the participant is deeply concentrated on the activity for its own sake and loses the sense of time and space. In the case of horror video games, flow might be better understood in relation to anxiety and fear, two emotions strongly felt by the player, by the player when playing these games. Of course, the balance between challenges and skills also influences the experience of the player. But two elements that might have an even greater impact are the energy the player has at their disposal and the frightening level of a game. If the player is constantly frightened, playing the game will ask them to invest a lot of energy and will become quickly draining. And if the player is not frightened enough, the, the game will lose its generic effects and will not allow for the expected experience. Horror flow happens when there is a fine balance between the player's energy and the frightening level of the game. In the horror flow channel, the player is anxious and frightened while still being able to play the game without becoming too easily exhausted and usually get some satisfaction from this experience. This feeling is comparable to that of flow in the sense that the player is absorbed by the game, but the emotions felt are intimately related to the world of horror video games. I would argue that in the case of Cry of Fear, the player never reaches the state of horror flow because they are overstimulated. So I would like now to briefly analyze three aspects or you know, three moments in Cry of Fear that led me to experience hurtful trauma. My analysis is structured around the concept of horror flow and the idea that Cry of Fear explores the sensitive boundary between impactful trauma and hurtful trauma, tempting players who are drawn toward extreme horror, but simultaneously putting them in danger of being overwhelmed and getting hurt. So the first element I would like to talk about is the confusing soundtrack uh, and, and the absence of forewarning, but they, goes, uh, they go together. Writing about films, Plantinga explains that music carries meaning in an affective charge and suggests the emotional valence of a scene. Along the same line, Wallen highlights that video games, quote, rely on important cognitive associations between types of music and interpretation of causality, physicality, and character, end quote. Music ultimately helps the player to navigate the game space. Cry of Fear plays with this more conventional use of music, relying on a broken causality to veil oral cues and immerse the player into a universe of unknowledge. The third chapter of the game, for example, start with the comforting music, giving the player the impression that they are safely exploring the city following a bus fight in a disturbing nightmare sequence. It takes less than two minutes before the player gets attacked again. The comforting music stop only once a monster hidden behind a minivan um, screams and attacks a player. This pattern is repeated a few times in the game, but not enough for the player to get used to it. Cry of Fear ultimately displays the, state, uh, the safety state, danger state binary to confuse the player, leading them to interpret the game cues in the wrong way and unconsciously influencing their concentration and their action readiness. The game is also characterized by the absence of a warning system that would inform the player of the presence of enemies. As Perron observes, warning systems have taken uh, different forms in survival horror games. In Silent Hill, the radio of the protagonist starts emitting white noise when an, whenever an enemy is nearby, whereas in Fatal Frame, the filament at the lower right corner of the screen glows orange. Other games like Resident Evil do not contain a warning system, but warn the player through off-screen sounds, such as the moaning of zombies, uh, such as the moaning of zombies, or yeah, or the sound of their footstep. Forewarning makes survival horror games more bearable by allowing the player to get ready to face a threat, avoid jump scares, and deduce when exploring can be done in relative, relative safety and in a way that is less draining. In contrast, the absence of a warning system and the quasi-absence of off-screen sounds in Cry of Fear 
make the player feel constantly threatened and lead them to always be on edge. As noted by Van Elferen, this sort of game design pushes the player to rely on their own insights instead of those of the game. At the same time, as the player progresses in the game and gets more and more affected by its disturbing content, it becomes increasingly difficult for them to think clearly. The second element I would like to talk about is the first person melee combat. Like many survival horror games, Cry of Fear is characterized by limited offensive resources. And in order to save ammunition, the player is encouraged to use melee weapons. The combination of a gameplay in the first person with the need to use melee weapons makes, makes encounters with monsters more visceral. As noted by Chris Iwinska, the first person perspective brings the player closer to the horror and reinforces the illusion that it is the player who is being attacked and not an abstract virtual self. Behron adds that games in the first person lead the player to sense textures when they get close to certain objects and to feel touch when their gaze is striking or assaulted. In the case of Cry of Fear, these observations apply especially well to encounters with the slower, the most common enemy of the game, who attacks the player with a hammer. I could not help but be constantly repulsed by this monster, fear its touch, and be particularly disturbed by the idea of getting hit by a hammer, as if I could feel through my body this monster striking Simon and crushing his bones. During melee fights, the player is encouraged to use their stamina to dodge attacks, making the fights more physical and producing a strong sense of presence. The combination of this combat system with the audio elements previously analyzed generates what Ash has called an intense pace, captivating the player and pushing them to become attuned to the game environment to survive the horror. In order to perform well, the player must open their body to visual and auditory feedback and be ready to pick out any relevant detail from their environment, hence putting themselves in a position of affective vulnerability. This space becomes quickly exhausting, leads to hypervigilance and oversensitivity, and facilitates the transmission of video trauma through the senses. So finally, I would like to finish with a more personal example, my meeting with Sophie. As I reached Westwood Gardens, I received a phone call from a stranger. I had difficulties to hear them, but I understood that they wanted to meet me on the rooftop of a building nearby. Upon reaching the rooftop, I realized that the caller was Sophie, one of Simon's close friends. Meeting Sophie had a profound impact on me. The encounters I had had uh, with other humans at that point in the game had been rather disturbing and had all been associated with death. The conversation with Sophie provided me with the first peaceful moment of the game after roughly five hours of terror. Simon and Sophie sat down together on the edge of the rooftop, their legs dangling in the air and talked about school life. The soundtrack changed from a near music to a calm and melancholic one. The sequence alternated between shots of Simon's and so Simon and Sophie talking together, shots of the city at night, and shots of the star shining in the sky, giving the scene an overall soothing atmosphere. It was comforting to be able to interact with someone else in a genuine way, and for the first time in the game, I did not feel alone. The scene suddenly turned tragic, with Sophie jumping off the rooftop to her death, instantly transforming a comforting moment into a traumatic one. I could not believe what had just happened. It was so sudden. I was sad and shocked. I felt as if something had just slipped from my hand, as if I had not been fast enough to grab Sophie's arm. Sophie's death had a strong resonance and stayed with me for the rest of the game. It evoked for me the absurdity of existence, the feeling that everything was pointless. I kept wondering why I was surrounded by death and what was the point to keep existing as Simon, to keep suffering. The absence of other humans and meaningful relationships in the game was not only affecting Simon, but was affecting me as well. Cry of Fear had successfully put me in the same position as Simon, reducing narrative and affective mediation and making the experience of loss and loneliness more hurtful. I was alone again and slowly realizing that it would be like this until the end of the game. So to conclude, Playing Cry of Fear was for me an unpleasant experience that put into question my assumptions about the horror genre. I did not know before playing this game that it was possible to experience fear and art horror so strongly. 
The shocking images of violence, suicide and depression did me violence. The on-screen violence continued off-screen, across my body, to paraphrase Nadali Ennis. Thinking back about my experience playing Resident Evil Zero or The Evil Within, two games I have finished, generates feeling of, feelings of excitement, nostalgia and pride. But I hardly experience any of these feelings when I think of Cry of Fear. In fact, revisiting my memories of this game to write this paper was rather challenging. Watching back my playthrough, looking at pictures of the game and reading about it made me feel anxious and nauseous and even depressed. For me as a player, there will be a before and an after cry of fear. This is what push, pushes me to argue that I experienced something close to horror. And it is precisely there that I see the possibility of a dialogue between horror studies and trauma theory. So far, scholars in the humanities have tended to talk about trauma in a rather general way. The concepts of impactful trauma and hurtful trauma proposed in this paper could be used as a starting point to theorize how other video games or other media induce trauma in the player. Talking about our traumatic experiences through these two concepts allows for a more nuanced account of what we go through as players and allows us to reflect on key moments where our experience goes from being impactful to being hurtful. Um, so that's what I have. Here's the bibliography. I have the ludography. Uh, and thank you. And hopefully we have time for, for questions later. So I'll stop the share to share. Well, thank you, Sam, for the presentation. Uh, we will now move on to our third and final speaker for this panel. Uh, Shorka Bhattacharji is currently a PhD research scholar at the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad, and he has done his MPhil in the University of Calcutta. His academic interest lies in modern and postmodern poetry, game studies, and posthumanism. Today, he will be presenting uh, the paper titled uh, Emergent Behavior or Artificial Intelligence, the question of ethical behavior in gaming. Uh, welcome, Nishar. Yeah, hello, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity for presenting my paper. Uh, so my paper is titled Emergent Behavior or Artificial Intelligence, the question of ethical behavior in gaming. Uh, I'll begin right away. My paper consists of three aspects. Uh, a philosophical argument on emergence and artificial intelligence, a critical commentary on the movie Free Guy, and a discussion regarding ethics in action adventure games like GTA, Sin City, and Fortnite. Allow me to begin with the philosophical argument, which draws upon the Sotis paradox. This paradox is attributed to the Greek philosopher Ibilides of Miletius, and variations of it has been used by other philosophers thereafter. It asks a very interesting question. Say you have got a heap of stones, and I start removing one stone at a time from the heap. Say there are 15 stones, and I remove one, and it becomes 14, and then 13, and so on. Now, at what point does what you have cease to be a heap? Will you call it a heap if it has at least 5 stones, or 4 stones, or 3 stones? The point of this demonstration is that the change in quantity can at a point become a qualitative change and that it is hard, if not impossible, to locate the exact point where the qualitative transformation occurs. So, uh, to give another example, uh, hair loss is a qualitative change, but this I mean, quantitative change, but this quantitative change becomes qualitative when hair loss gets to the point of resulting in baldness. I bring up this sortis paradox, which in Latin means the paradox of the heap, to explain the ambiguous difference between emergent behavior and artificial intelligence. The movie Free Guy, directed by Sean Levy and produced by Ryan Reynolds, speculates upon a non-playable character or NPC in a game called Free Guy, I mean Free City. That's the name of the game in the movie, Free City. 
the protagonist guy played by Ryan Reynolds incidentally attains artificial intelligence now my contention is that the movie confuses the distinction between emergent behavior and artificial intelligence and that somewhat problematizes the point on ethical gaming behavior that free guy is trying to make any npc in a game is said to perform uh, yeah uh, a specific set of functions now emergence would occur when that npc comes to perform activities that exceed the originally planned set this might happen owing to a number of reasons intentional as well as accidental so what we witness in case of emergence is a substantial quantitative increase in the number of functions that the npc is capable of in the movie the protagonist guy attains a situational awareness which allows his behavior to develop variations of the functions expected of him such as greeting the player uh, in manners he is not supposed to he gradually starts behaving and leveling up like a player instead of being limited like an M- npc even if not to this degree emergent behavior is actually a well known phenomena in modern gaming and it often comes across as very interesting be it the case of gandhi becoming a nuclear warmonger in civilization or the glitch named missing no uh, becoming an official pokemon in pokemon red and blue it might be argued that emergence is quant- qualitative in the sense that the character does not only exceed its initial quantitative limits but attains an artificial life in this case the expression that the character has attained an a life of its own is quite literally applicable however artificial intelligence would require a different form and degree of qualitative change what might be called transcendental because it requires a change in the nature of consciousness guy initially attains a situational awareness which is characteristic of a game ai as supposed to an npc in the movie he becomes aware of the mechanisms of the game which become visible when as a throwback to the movie they live he puts on glasses usually worn by the playable characters but a game game ai differs from an agi or artificial general intelligence in that the former has a situational awareness whereas the latter has a reflective awareness what is that by situational awareness i mean that the game can function as an ai but only within its own parameters but reflective awareness allows sentient beings to not only multiply the number of things they can do but also be aware of the nature of things they are doing and in turn be aware of themselves to take up roger penrose's argument machines can compute 2 plus 2 equals 4 but an artificial intelligence can understand 2 plus 2 equals 4 this capacity for understanding or reflective awareness characterizing artificial general intelligence finds its best expression in the ability for self awareness self awareness okay uh, guy incidentally undergoes that qualitative change whereby he attains a self awareness which allows him to realize that he is an npc in the game as opposed to being a regular individual in a real life place called free city but the movie confuses the distinction between the two states of artificial life and artificial intelligence by calling guy the latter even before he has attained that self awareness the ethical point made in the movie is regarding the treatment meted out to npcs in games like gta where the players are encouraged towards antisocial behaviors the question becomes can the player treat the npcs with the same degree of carelessness once they know that the npcs are capable of consciousness
When delivered with the tongue-in-cheek humor of Reynolds, the movie effective, effectively evades the pitfalls of wokeness that may dampen entertainment. Yet, its theme is part of the general shift from human rights to the broader category of sentience rights that occur in today's judicial discussions. So, could you commit violence upon an NPC that easily if you knew it is sentient? But the counter question that I would like to raise here is that does the NPC have to be sentient or potentially sentient in the first place to deserve an ethical treatment? While the movie does decenter anthropocentrism with its take on AI, it nonetheless affirms sentiocentrism. So, while we find an interesting ethical intervention in Free Guy, the sentiocentric principle of AI upon which Free Guy raises that ethical question is problematic. Let me now bring out that problem with the help of the Sotis paradox. So, the question of qualitative transformation raised in the Sotis paradox would in this case make us ask at what point does emergence lead to self-awareness? Self-awareness involves a transcendental change since it requires the breaking of the fourth wall, something Ryan Reynolds is well known for. In an age of extended cinematic universes and easter eggs, Hollywood productions regularly tease the boundaries of fiction by drawing upon cultural and intertextual references from other sources. Free Guy, for that matter, draws upon other movies like The Truman Show, The Matrix, and refers to other Disney and even MCU products. But Free Guy or Deadpool do not just hint at breaking the fourth wall, but literally break it. This transcendental transformation is conveniently explained through Deadpool, who is biologically a cancerous body that is somewhat, uh, somehow immune to death. Deadpool similarly voraciously accumulates cultural tissues into its cancerous mass to the point where he becomes aware of himself as a cultural product. Free Guy significantly enhances its uh, cultural vocabulary and breaks the fourth wall by featuring accident actual uh, game streamers like Jacksepticeye Eye or Pokemon. But the movie's logic becomes ambiguous at the exact point where emergence leads to artificial intelligence since it is actually not through a spontaneous evolution of consciousness. Rather, the deus ex machina of romance becomes the key ingredient for that dawning of self-consciousness. The unexplained mechanism of love is symptomatic of the inexplicability of the demarcation between the two stages. So love functions like the step jump in maths that we used in school to match the required answer. We later learn in the movie that love was an intentional part of Guy's original code through which he was meant to attain self-awareness. But the point is, that the importance of the NPC's existence could only be validated through this characteristically Hollywoodesque trope of romance. So, Free Guy does open up the very important question of ethical behavior in game and emphasizes the possibility of thinking about ethics through gaming. But this consideration of ethics is more speculative rather than functional, owing to the anthropocentric and uh, culturally specific approach to the issue. Games like Spec Ops, Fallout 4, or Metal Gear, on the other hand, use the game narrative to evoke ethical questions without needing to incorporate a fourth world breaking. Brenda Romero's series of games called the mechanics is the message is also offers an alternative form of ethical reflection, one that uses the mechanics of the game rather than explicit uh, narrative for the purpose. The movie Free Guy speculates about ethical gaming through the idea of a game called Life Itself, 
a zero player game in which fully emergent npcs shall run the entire show guy being the adam in that new eden of life itself reminiscent of the real life game called the game of life that was designed by jh conway life itself would therefore undo any possibility of unethical behavior by making artificial life autonomous but by eliminating all possibilities of player action to prevent unethical turns one also eliminates all possibilities of ethics altogether in the absence of any choice making the ethical consideration once again becomes purely speculative so uh, to conclude the self referential referentiality characteristic of the film of films like free guy offers a new way of interrogating intelligence but at the same time it also poses intelligence as something irreplaceable or irreplaceable rather uh, irrepre- irrepre- okay <laughs> irreplaceable as in not replaceable as the key point upon which all ethical arguments should revolve around so that is the problem uh, that free guy raises and it is actually unable to answer that but it uh, the raising of that problem is very important and interesting for uh, the study of games and especially the study of ethics in gaming okay thank you everyone Uh, well, thank you for that pres- uh, presentation, Ishwara. Uh, so now we will be taking questions. Uh, please uh, feel uh, re- free to raise your hands to ask these questions, or you can uh, uh, type them in the chat, and I would be asking these questions. So, well, uh, to get the ball rolling, first we do have some questions. Uh, the first being a question for Samuel, and that is by Ishan Kukhet. He says, uh, "Hi Samuel, thank you for the presentation. I hope this question is not off topic. Spec Ops: The Line intended to transmit the trauma felt by the protagonist Walker to the player and make them question their actions. A notable example being having the player walk through a field of civilians killed by white phosphorus. Would you feel that this was impactful trauma that made the players actually question themselves and the genre? Was the game at all effective in this purpose?" Yes, hi. Thank you for the question, and I think I'm gonna answer to this one. But also, there's there was kind of a conversation about this game and about also a, a Call of Duty and the campaign uh, No Russian. So I've not played uh, Spec Ops, but it's definitely a game that has been studied uh, in relation to trauma by Toby Smethers, for example. Uh, Brendan Keogh also wrote a, a book about it. Um, Killing is harmless. It's very very interesting. Um, so I had read your question, and I have this quote actually from Toby Smethers. Um, uh, so you know, I I cannot really say if it's impactful trauma, if it's hurtful trauma. It really depends on the on the player and how they see the game. Um, I have I would say that Toby Smethers seems to have experienced hurtful trauma, uh, but you know, what I think, it, it, yeah, it's very personal. But I'm just going to read this quote because I think it's very interesting. It's from her PhD actually, and so she wrote. Uh, about Spec Ops The Line. Rationally, I knew this was absurd. Afterwards, I reminded myself that these were virtual civilians, not real ones. And besides, the game is programmed in such a way that if you want to finish it, you have to use the white phosphorus. But none of this rationalization changed how horrified I had felt, along with the protagonist on discovering the shared bodies that he, we, I had produced. If trauma studies had taught me one thing, it is that fictional events can have real effects on one's outlook and ethics. I have had experiences with or within fiction that have stayed with me for years to the point that I occasionally have to remind my that I have to remind myself that they did not uh, really happen uh, to me. The fact that I felt the need to rationalize my guilt over spec ups the line in the first place demonstrated just how real of an effect the game had. Uh, had on me. So I think this is an interesting uh, uh, quote because it really shows how trauma stays with you, how it's intrusive. Um, in the case of, uh, uh, yeah, the campaign No Russian, I, I don't know how, 
again, I, it depends on player, but I don't know if it really leads to trauma uh, because for me, this is the, the big, that, that's why I'm talking about trauma as saying impactful trauma, but also hurtful trauma is usually well-crafted in the gameplay and the game narrative. If it's just something shocking, I'm not sure it has the same effect on you, you know, like the when you see these very violent games, maybe they are shocking when you play when you play them for the first time and maybe you are shocked for, you know, five minutes or maybe you think a little bit about it, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's something that really stays with you. Whereas uh, in the way I see uh, trauma and I try to theorize it, it has to stay with you. So that's why I would say, um, for spec ups, yes, but for for Call of Duty, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, uh, Arutha has a question. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Hello, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay, so my question is for Samuel on the question of uh, on the topic of. Uh, so if if we can use your the model you presented as a sort of getting into uh, creating a sort of tool for analyzing trauma uh, i was thinking that uh, about the tool that how would you factor in customizability in many ways uh, and to, to elaborate a bit that what customizable what I mean by customizability is in the sense that for example uh, the environment we are playing in the uh, for example if the game is uh, a multiplayer uh, in sort of some that sort of sense uh, because in fact a cry of fear also has uh, co-op uh, campaigns I, and uh, so in that ex ex essence so for example, I mean, I can if even if I change the time of day, the the, the impact might be different. Uh, even when I'm playing, or in which uh, sometimes difficulty becomes a very important thing, accessibility, difficulty, these sort of the parameters that can that we can customize on our on our own. Those sorts of things, how will they factor into? Uh, the impact that is created uh, that is uh, that it has it might even it might not always be you know uh, lessening the trauma it might also increase uh, the, for example even even in multiplayer we can have the sense of loneliness and yeah that it's only me so i i that is my question that how would you factor in uh, these sorts of customizability that is uh, obviously one of the most important aspects of video gaming and interactive mediums uh, into the idea of the tools that you're that you have presented thank you okay uh, thanks this is a hard question i mean i'm not um, well yeah so uh, cry of fear there is the multiplayer mode i have not played it i'm not sure i would i will i don't think i would have experienced trauma with it or if you have played it you could maybe uh, mention about your experience. That would be interesting. Um, I mean, the the way I'm I'm, and you know, this is like a, an ongoing project. I this is this paper is based on my master. Now I'm still working on that for my PhD. Um, but so the way I'm trying to analyze trauma is to by having this dual stance. So on on the there's this kind of very personal experience of trauma, and um, and that's why. I, and in that sense, I'm using more kind of close reading and autoethnography. And on the other side, I'm also trying to look at um, trauma in terms of in relation to transgressive games and the work of uh, Mortensen and Jorgensen, uh, and look at it from a more for, uh, formal um, formal perspective. So, uh, for the so what I mean by that is that I'm I'm it's it's very hard to generalize, uh, and the customization you're talking about. Uh, like of course will influence the the way you experience trauma, um, and that that's why also when I'm analyzing cry of fear, there are when I'm talking more about the sound and about the atmosphere and creating distinct in space. I think these are example of elements that are more kind of formal. Uh, I don't know if I can say formal. I mean like formalist in French. I'm sorry. I don't know how to translate it, but but like kind of elements that you can I think generalize or or that affect most people. Whereas where it's more personal elements, like, 
you know, like for me, I'm I'm really I'm I'm really affected by suicide and by depression. So so for me, the the event with Sophie had a really strong impact on me. And of course, it can have impact on other players as well. But I think this was uh, something more personal. Um, now for the so you know with this, I, I'm not really trying to come up with a model that can take into account everything. I, it's it's more about saying like, oh, this game led me to experience that. And I think there's a dialogue possible between my experience and that of other players. But I think right now the point was more to kind of come up with this concept that we, and we can try to apply them to different games. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Um, and yeah, and, and now if you have played the multiplayer uh, uh, mode in Cry of Fear, I, I, don't, I don't know, if you want to talk about it, that would be interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I won't take a long time, but I, it, my idea wasn't about just the multiplayer of Cry of Fear. It was about any kind of multiplayer, because even in uh, non-horror games, uh, even in multiplayer, there can come up these sorts of uh, traumatic events and experiences. So uh, that's basically that. what I was thinking, that uh, because, you know, these raise interesting sort of problems. Uh, I won't be taking up too much time from the panel, so I, I'm muting right now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and you I for think, your answer. I, I really like that answer. Thank and you. I think, yes, thank you. And it's a good question about all this multiplayer aspect. I don't really tend to talk about it because I don't really play multiplayer games. But also with the multiplayer aspect, there's also the fact that other players, the way they are interacting with you, and you know, there was the like, what was it in Daisy? I think that they have all these people like. I don't know, get fighting against each other and you're, you're basically losing all your stuff and all the stuff you had in the game you had collected. So this, I guess, can also lead to a form of trauma, but then there's all the aspect of, you know, you have to take into account other players and yeah. I'm gonna stop talking, thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question for Nishorgo. And that is that you have mainly been uh, talking about, say, uh, how effective change can be brought in players' attitudes towards this kind of thing, uh, NPCs and ethics. And you have talked about how some of the games also use narratives as a means to kind of uh, bring up that discussion. But uh, what are your views upon how game mechanics can also you know, contribute to that? For example, uh, in the Assassin's Creed games, there's this concept called desynchronization that prevents you from killing civilians, as well as you cannot harm children in games like Skyrim. So what was uh, your views on that? Uh, yeah, so uh, when it comes to mechanics, well, ethics uh, cannot be possible. Like I think, uh, the ethical dimension won't be there if choice is not there. So if you in the first place take out the element of choice, like you cannot do that, then there's no point in of ethics there. On the other hand, when I was thinking of this game uh, called the mechanics is the message. Uh, for example, I'll give the example of that game called Trains from that uh, series. In this particular game, what happens is that uh, the player is meant to load certain stuffs on the train. Uh, now. At the end of the game, uh, we come to realize that the destination to which the game is, uh, the train is going is out switch. And the things that have been loaded upon the train are basically uh, Jews who are going to out switch the concentration camp. So it's, the, it's not a narrative, but the mechanics that reveals the uh, problem or the ethical issue here. Now, in this particular case, unlike Assassin's Creed, uh, the there's no uh, point at which the player is unable to do something. So they have to confront the ethical uh, consequence of what they have done, right? So in this case, mechanics uh, does offer uh, ethical dimension, whereas in those cases you have cited, I think it's basically taking out of the, taking the uh, ethical dimension out of the hands of the player altogether. Well, thank you for that answer. Uh, next, we have Protiji Chatterjee, who's raised your hands up. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, yeah, uh, I actually have a question for Nishurga. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Uh, so No, it's all right. 
so yeah, uh, again, uh, going back to uh, Joffrey's point as well about uh, Skyrim not letting uh, you harm children, but mm -hmm. the ethical um, dilemma here that the player undergoes that uh, there is this particular uh, part where if you kill the mother of a child later on the child um, the late later on the child actually expresses grief yeah. over her dead mother and accuses you and then refuses to be adopted by you later on you can hoodwink the child you can you know um, not let the child know that you are the one responsible for the mother's death and adopt her but you can see the grief on the child's face and the words that the child is saying so you can uh, the, the grief is projected the again um, coming to uh, samuel's point the trauma is projected so here even the uh, in skyrim especially even the npcs even the minor NPCs, they show they are capable of grief, they are capable of uh, trauma, they are capable of uh, expressing their grief as well. So here the ethical um, component is pretty high. I was just um, expressing a comment. That's all. What are your views on it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a nice example of the narrative mm -hmm. uh, revealing uh, the ethical dimension of gaming and i think this is a new and important direction that's that gaming is taking because uh well games are generally thought of as uh things which are outside of the realm of ethics and therefore not taken seriously uh, but this is a new direction because now we are realizing that games can be a medium very important medium and uh for contemplating thought uh, contemplating uh serious dimensions of life without like making the game uh, uh not entertaining anymore or so, so, such things so that's um, thank you for the example that's a really interesting example of the narrative really making one think rather than simply ent be entertained by a game exactly exactly uh, thank you so much for your response thank you thank you uh, well, uh, so far we have uh, a retro uh, asking a question, and then we do have Shorik Mukherjee, who has a question for Angshuman. So we'll start with the retro first. Hello, my question is for Angshuman. Uh, my question is basically when, when we're talking about the supply in uh, Outer Wilds, uh, one of the interesting thing, interesting problem for me that comes here is that, uh, you know, the question of uh, the grandeur is decreased by the specific time mechanics that is present because it isn't like we are given a huge vast span of time rather we are giving give, given 30 real life uh, minutes so that is my one of my uh, uh, points about uh, how would you like factor in timing in the question of sublime in outer worlds in the sense that, uh, for example, temporal mechanics are very novel and uh, very sparsely used in across video games, uh, and most of the time, time make it, time mechanics and time uh, time dimensions are very controversial. But the whole game is sort of uh, here is a is itself a time timed mission. That uh, the whole game is a timed mission. So my question is that, how would you factor in time in the sense of Sublime uh, in the in how how time helps in uh, presenting and portray uh, portraying or reinforcing uh, the sublime in outer worlds. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> that's a nice question. In the twenty-two minutes uh, time loop that we have in outer worlds, the first time you realize that you are stuck in that little bit of a time loop. Uh, it's it. it induces a sort of first of all a curiosity why what is happening and then the dread and uh, as you walk through each loop figure trying to figure out what happens that dread persists at the ending uh, at the ending of each loop which i was talking about that let's say if you have played the game 
uh, let's say you're deep into the keys of uh, one of the whole man, uh, one of the bi binary planets or in brittle hollow, you're in the Nomai range. You have uh, taken time to go there and then you messed something up and now you're running against time. You're right, it could have been more time. It would have given the, the players um, a little bit of a more time to experience or explore the place. But that limited sense of time is very necessary to have that uh, the, the experience that Outer Wilds was trying to create, the, the, the notion of hurrying, the notion of uh, trying to figure out as much as you can before everything is set back. That is one point I would like to make. The second is because of the time loop, the other sense of awe that uh, I felt and I didn't mention in the paper is you are relieving uh, the same day again and again and again and again <coughs> till you figure out how to stop the time loop and change everything. But uh, so your memories get reset or replanted back into your head or the protagonist's head and then you relieve the day. But nobody else can believe you. Nobody else knows what is happening. And when you tell them, they are incredulously looking at you and thinking that you have gone wrong in the head. And if I remember correctly, only one uh, other NPC in the game is actually aware that they are stuck in a time loop. And when you find them, when you talk to them, it just feels like you're connecting with someone who knows what is going on. And you have been all alone, all throughout your game team. Nobody knows what is going on. Nobody is aware of anything. You do not know what, who to talk to, who to connect with. They're only looking at vestiges of the past, past conversations, ruins, which I uh, mentioned in the answer in the chat. The ruins, you're constantly look, going around and looking at these beings that were there, but they have died. You do not know why. You're constantly stuck. You cannot even die. You cannot even properly live. So this time loop mechanism is very, very interesting and very, very necessary to create this sense. And uh, it, it just it just enforces the, the kind of an existential dread, kind of uh, loneliness in you. You're already very alone in space and the music is the only thing that is making you aware that there are other people on other planet. You're already very alone there. And all you can hear most of the time is your own breath and things like that as you walk around. So you can't even connect with anybody else. So that becomes a huge uh, aspect while you realize, uh, I'll give you a short example of this. Uh, in the DLC called uh, Echoes of the Eye, you come across another civilization and they have a different uh, language and you come back and tell it to one of the scientists on your planets. And they tell you that give them six months and a few more examples and they will decipher the language. The sad part is, you know, there are there is no six months. It's just a 22 minutes uh, loop or 22 minutes later, everything is going to go away. But they don't know that. So I think that is uh, why the time loop here is very, very necessary or is kind of integral to the sense of sublime that exists within outer wilds. Thank you for that answer, Amshini. Uh, and I think we have one more question for you from Shobhit Mukherjee. Uh, so, Shobhit sir, could you ask a question? Uh, um, Jeffrey, yeah, uh, I think he's already responded to me, but I'll ask it because uh, then everyone can hear it. So uh, I was asking about, uh, you know, the importance of ruins in games. Matthias already talks about the ruin in Zane Zucht or the longing for decay in video game spaces. And I've also asked about Daniel Vela's concept of the ludic sublime. I'm sure you've looked at it on Truman, where he talks about the aesthetic effect resulting from a foregrounding of the sense of mystery. And uh, then uh, also, uh, you know, uh, Vela also talks about the Gothic sublime in Dark Souls. So I was wondering how your observations on the sublime, uh, you know, of, in the outer wilds would compare with these earlier kind of comments uh, by games researchers, how they would speak to, how you would speak to them. And then I have a follow-up question that once you answer. Okay, I'll, I'll just uh, take it from whatever I was saying in the chat. Uh, the ruins are a very uh, interesting part of sublime and 
uh, I I kind of quoted paraphrased from this person I had checked while uh, reading upon the sublime for my masters and for while I was doing this paper was from a person called George P. Lando, professor of English and the history of art. Anyway, he talks about the different forms of sublimity that there are in ruins. So he says the large ruins, like uh, he has a picture of it, produce the elemental sublimity of size. And I already mentioned the idea about size and how the spectator of the film is drawn. That is very important in uh, this in eliciting this sense of sublime. Burke talks about it, it is a kind of terror. Uh, you, you won't get it un unless that 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 your, your imagination, your, your understanding, your reasoning is overwhelmed by that, that force, that, that large something. Uh, so the ruins are for that. And the other point that the professor makes is also a very interesting point is the ruins are sort of a check for the player or even for men or, women, or even for humanity at, at large is that time erodes everything. Uh, time erodes whatever whatever monument, whatever structures they have built, and you can see that you can see the ruination of the stamp of man on the earth and on the earth or on planets, and that is being ruined by time. And this and the idea of Gothic architecture and the Gothic genre invokes this kind of uh, dwarfing and sense of awe and terror, or even the uncanny, the Gothic uncanny and sublime uh, features massively in psychoanalysis with Freud's uncanny and the later works, uh, even in Lacan. So that is one of the things I was uh, I talked about in the chat about the ruins of the Numai cities and places, and the other one was of dark souls. Well, so yes, of course, the mystery is one of the most important sense of this awe and dread or reverence or respect or whatever have you. Uh, and if you remember in the paper, I talked about how after the first time, uh, the, the supernova sort of loses its dread. You do not fear it or you do not, you're not shocked. You're not awed by it. I mean, of course, the grander states, when you look at it, you look at the, the massive beauty of it and you realize that that can actually happen in reality and has been happening in the different places. But uh, the, the trade goes in and the mystery is one of the most important part of it because the whole of Outer Wilds runs on this mystery. You have no detection other than go out into space and uh, just roam around, do whatever you feel like. So you're trying to figure out why what is happening and you don't even know what is happening, much less than the why. So you have to go at places, look at rooms, look at decayed uh, memories, conversations and try to slowly, slowly piece together the whole thing. And this is why mystery is very important in creating this sense of awe. And uh, I also, I think I quoted uh, Vela, yes. In practice, however, Dark Souls set out, to, uh, out with the express purpo uh, purpose of unsettling these preconceptions, deploying a range of formal techniques and mechanisms designed to arrest the player's judgment and prevent her from arriving at a stable cosmic understanding, preserving a sense of mystery and gesturing towards a whole that escapes players' conceptualizing grasp. So the mystery kind of destabilizes the player. I hope that kind of answers the question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So I can I, Jeffrey, if I have your permission, can I ask a follow-up question uh, on this? Or if there's uh, we do have time, of course. Okay, thanks. So uh Chuan, uh, I mean this is uh, something that's been teasing me for a while. Uh, I'm I'm working on games which uh, deal with space travel, and uh, in terms of how they address issues of colonialism, how the whole idea of kind of space controlling space, uh, seeing space and kind of like experiencing space becomes like something that is part of the individual subjective experience, as if of the global north mainly, but uh, also kind of in general kind of the. Uh, whoever is kind of doing that, like in space travel, this idea of just like this game called No Man's Sky. I haven't played Outer Wilds, I must admit, but uh, something even in No Man's Sky, you can kind of just stand there and, and look at uh, the world and take it in. But the taking it in, the, the whole experience of sublimity, in a sense, is also kind of uh, uh, um, going hand in hand with the notion of conquest or at least a wish to kind of. Uh, uh, wish to uh, sort of just with your vision, just with your experience to claim as your own. I mean, I, I'll just kind of end with an example. Uh, Cecil Rhodes, who's, as you know, who 
very egotistically uh, named a country Rhodesia, and uh, after whom now the Rhodes Scholarship is available. You know, uh, Cecil Rhodes uh, used to look up at the skies and cry because he could not conquer the stars. So uh, he wanted to colonize the stars. So I'm just kind of thinking of, of that kind of thing, space, the final frontier and space kind of, you know, looking at space and experiencing the sublime. But also, is that not kind of also concomitant with a, with a sense of wanting to colonize or, uh, or kind of possess? Okay. So what do you think? Yeah. Uh, so recently, I actually uh, read a paper on No Man's Sky and colonization. And I actually will tell you the quote from Cecil Rhodes because I started my paper with that. He said, the world is nearly all parceled out. And what there is left of it is being divided up, conquered, and colonized. To think of these stars that you see over at the time. Cool. My <laughs> book. <laughs> these vast worlds which we can never reach. I would annex the planets if I could. I often think of that. It makes me sad to see them so clear and yet so far. Yes, uh, space travel, or rather any space, I, I think humanity at its most basic uh, is has this need of whatever they see they want to have. They want to take it in, they want to destroy it. Uh, I mean, we start with eating and eating is just putting it in your mouth and destroying and changing the form of it. So sub, the, the sublime is, in, in my opinion, right at the cusp of uh, getting there. As in, we see it, we are in awe, we do not know what it is. And the moment we try to know what it is, the sublime goes away. And then the, the notion of conquest or the, the idea of getting a mastery over it comes in. Because the moment there is a mastery, I do not think the sublime at its... So the supernova is kind of no longer as grand, right? And then Exactly. Yeah. But, but I, I will say it's not as, like, as I was saying, the dread was lessening, but we still do not know why it was happening. And uh, why I would say the supernova still was grand, even when the last time I saw it, and even when I was showing you guys, I was like, uh, okay, it still makes me feel things, is because I still have no mastery over it. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I cannot. And that's one of the interesting things in the game. The, the Nomais, the previous civilization, they tried to, uh, like, sort of create a situation where the sun will go supernova. And they failed. They couldn't get a mastery of the sun. Uh, so don't you think that this opens up, I mean, it's not just for video game studies, but I'm looking at literary studies. I know you're from literary studies background and other uh, disciplines. Don't you think this opens up a, a, a different way of looking at the sublime as, the, uh, as, as kind of colonization and sub, the sublime and how they're linked, really, which we don't normally discuss in terms of sublime. When you read about sub, sublimity in the romanticism, it's all also pure and so kind of like, uh, you know, something that should be experienced. But like you said, that this, this, uh, the whole idea of space tra travel and kind of sublime and control with a video game, especially you can, you can actually interact and control to a degree. Uh, so this idea of being at a cusp of basically where you could move into notions of colonization. Uh, don't you think it opens up kind of a different avenue, even for non-game studies kind of uh, readings uh, really? Of course it does, but in academia, as I'm sure most of us are aware, they have this uh, like very compartmentalized, romanticized notions of theories that they don't want to get out of. And uh, they will always try to take whatever, you, if you're saying something that is perverse, and perverse as it, I mean by not the, following the traditional norm, they will either cast it out or they will just see and see that somehow or the other that has been prophesized or predicted by the, the central notion of, maybe they will take it back to Longinus sublime. I do not know, but they won't be very happy about us doing these kind of things. And it's, it's sad because that- Conference that, is perverse, but, uh, but I'm sure kind of, there's a lot of, lot of kind of uh, space for the perverse and the yeah. playful is often perverse, right? Yes. The concept of play is perverse in some respects. So. Uh, yesterday, someone was telling me that in Christian theology, apparently there are, uh, uh, you know, comments which say that play is evil. I'm, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but just saying that, you know, in that sense, then post-structuralism also kind of, you know, uh, sort of uh, teases this area. So maybe this is an avenue to explore. 
Of course, of course, of course, it is an uh, avenue to uh, explore. And I actually got the opportunity to uh, contribute on colonization and space travels vis-a-vis -vis No Man's Sky for a book. Uh, so I, I am trying to explore the way that uh, all of these are turning around in space travel and more so with people like Elon Musk and uh, the other guy, Bezos and these people uh, on board their phallic structures trying to go and interact that space nowadays. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very contemporary, it's very topical. And, uh, and it's it, all, it, it, it happened since the kind of the beginning of time, really. I mean, if, uh, Cecil Rhodes is an example, really, in the 19th yeah, century. Yeah, of course, Manifest Destiny is their, their Bible for doing these kind of things and justifying it as, uh, well, I'm trying to help you. So, yeah, and that's of course there. Always been very sublime, really, looking <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank yeah, you. That was a lovely question. Uh, we have, I guess, two more questions. Uh, first is from Kotipi Chatterjee. You can unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, actually, re uh, regarding the sublime and the discussion about uh, colonization, uh, isn't that how we started looking at uh, enlightenment ideals as well? Uh, we started questioning. At first, the enlightenment ideals were put on a pedestal. And then we started questioning that, that the reasons and the rationality behind uh, enlightenment ideals. And then we saw how it was linked to imperialism. So in the same way, uh, if there is a problematic uh, narrative uh, structure to sublime, uh, and if it does um, relate to uh, colonialism or colonization, uh, I guess there is always a, a way to inspect that. So, yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, I would like to say one thing to this. You know, that's that's an interesting way of thinking about the Enlightenment period. And if you're talking about retrospectively from now or how Enlightenment went into the Romantic and all that, uh, but I only like to say one thing. I do not believe sub sublime in its nature has a problematic as aspect. Uh, what I do believe is it it is led on to problematic things. In itself, I do not I would not say that sub uh, sublime or effects of sublimity has a problematic uh, problematic anything problematic about it. It's rather as I was telling uh, Shuru sir that it's within us the conquering nature the the quest for colonization which is within us and after the moment of sublimity that is what drives us to conquer and, uh, on conquests and things like that but otherwise yeah. yeah nice observation yeah exactly but then again it becomes the signifier signified uh, debate right so if uh, the signified has changed then obviously it's because the uh, the word sublime has had some, um, you can say, uh, has had some kind of uh, ideology behind it or some kind of uh, hegemonical uh, influence behind it. And that's why we have started construing it in another way. Uh, getting my point, like in the uh, novel by Orville, 1984, uh, the words itself aren't problematic. It's how they are being utilized that's being problematic. So if if uh, sublime and colonization are being linked, I think it's something that that can be investigated further. I'm not saying that uh, uh, it starts out as I I get it that sublime and its um, and uh, its elements uh, were not problematic to begin with, but it did become problematic awesome. later on. So, uh, maybe investigating how it became problematic, why it started getting associated uh, in certain ways, uh, I think that can be investigated. Yeah, of course, definitely that can be investigated. Or uh, it's, it's not started getting, I wouldn't say it's started getting associated, but we should be making these associations and links to see uh, these things can be further. But I would like to say one point is you said that in Orwell words to, are not problematic, but how they are associated. So the signifier-signifier relationship is already always being deferred. 
there is a breakdown in meaning and everything. So by that same logic, sublime is not problematic. It's mm. what we do with sublime that becomes problematic. It's how we yeah. associate sublime and how we act upon it that becomes problematic. So mm. again, the idealized, romanticized notion of the absolute mm. meaning will always remain impure, eh, always remain pure and not affected by these things. Then even, yeah, it's very important to, uh, to as Shovik has said, to sort of go, so sort of investigate the other parts of sublime, how sublime affects these things that have not been uh, as well looked at or investigated in uh, canons and traditional academia. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Shorga. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, actually, I wanted to uh, point out that Kant actually makes a distinction between the sublime and beauty. And he says that there are two forms, forms of sublime, mathematical and dynamic. But sublime is ultimately incomplete, and the complete part is beauty. Because sublime is something you cannot comprehend. When comprehension is complete, then it becomes beauty. Now, when you think of beauty, that actually is a much more colonizing idea in the sense that you have actually understood the other. Whereas sublime, when you come to the sublime, uh, it is incomplete and it recognizes that understanding has to stay incomplete, which is why I see, think romanticism tilts towards uh, the sublime as opposed to the beautiful. Uh, especially if I may think of Blake's The Tiger, something we have all read. Uh, Blake think, think, speaks about the fearful symmetry of the tiger, which is absolutely sublime. And see, this tiger's sublimity is so powerful that he resists the colonization of the uh, night, like the night he resides in. So the stars would intervene into the night, un uh, unable to intervene into it. So for it's understandable that Blake does not like Kant. He has made points against Kant again and again. And the reason being that he prefers the sublime as opposed to the beautiful. And that also further connects to the power fact that Blake was actually anti-abolished. And he actually spoke about the blacks in his po poetry much before we had such conversations in mainstream literature. Uh, so I think romanticism can be sort of interpreted as tilting towards sublimity and therefore uh, critiquing colonization, whereas idealism, Kantian idealism has aspects of colonizing uh, ideas, although I, I, I won't make it that general because at times romanticism too sort of justifies colonization. So that I think is interesting in this context. Jeffrey, since I can't raise my hand because I'm the host, uh, if I could just come in on this at some point whenever you're able to let me go. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, Amshun, do you have one to uh, like, respond to the yeah, One thing, yeah, yeah. That's a very uh, interesting throwback to Bleak. I haven't read that poem in a long, long while. Uh, just one thing, uh, it's, it's kind of generalizing or a bit reductive to see that Kant is uh, having colonistic tendencies, maybe sublime and beauty. But again, you see, some, see something like understanding the other makes you realize the beauty. I, I could not follow this line. I, I mean, what do you mean by understanding the other that makes you think about the beauty? I, uh, I, I could uh, explain this by the same thing I was saying about the grandeur of the supernova. The beauty of the supernova exists even when the sublime had gone away. And it is because of the mystery that uh, Shavik sir was so kind enough to talk about Vela and again, the mystery part of it. Uh, of course, romantics were it, uh, tilting towards the sublime. Most of the poetry were like that and even uh, the myth, examples of Alps and whatever they are talking about Alps, if you see those examples, they were very uh, romantic in, or at least pre-romantic and protocols of romanticism, you would see. So I agree with you on that point, but the other thing about uh, Kant being a uh, poverty colonialist, I would say that we okay, can have I a will, post Yeah, I concede the point that it's a bit of a generalization when it comes to Kant. But he actually makes that point regarding beauty. It's not my definition of beauty. It's Kant's no, no, definition of beauty about. as yeah, something that provokes disinterest. 
because finally we have arrived at understanding yeah. and he says that sublime is therefore incomplete we have to sort of come yeah. to the beauty that's the stage in between uh, when it comes to actually hegel is much more colonizing because yeah, hegel, hegel is you different. know is to teach history and used to have all these oriental perspective of history but uh, see hegel is basing i mean developing upon kant and that is where you find the element of colonization within kant i won't accuse kant of being colonizing yeah <laughs> that's a bit of an overstatement but you find the elements there like no of course you will find the elements because these are the yeah. sort of the building Colonizes... blocks of our philosophy and our yeah. understanding of most yeah. of the history be humanity anything else uh, what i would rather uh, characterize or uh, phrase it as is looking through a post colonial lens at these uh, thinkers uh, looking at them through these kind of filters would make us realize or maybe open up new meanings or new possibilities new interactions of this canonical text and maybe then we can decipher and see how far we can take it how far these branch out and how far they are affecting the psyche of humanity at large and as uh, specifics and individuals yeah absolutely i agree with you on that point we need that uh, post colonial lens for not just uh, post 1900 literature and philosophy but also pre 1900 literature and philosophy yes, yes i absolutely agree on that uh, so sovik mukherjee has a question that ties into this uh, i mean uh, jeffy it's a comment really i mean yeah, i would uh, talk about william jones William Jones and his uh, because you were mentioning romanticism and you know how the romantics were influenced by Jones and uh, uh, Jones in his poems the translations like him to Surya and so on i mean there is this notion of wonder mystery but at the same time there is there is also the notion of translating to control to possess a language to control and then to kind of present and jones keeps comparing uh, characters from indian mythology with uh, uh, characters from the iliad so it's kind of appropriation and uh, and control really i mean so uh, this innocence of romanticism uh, i mean as kind of uh, well it's it's quite uh, well tied with uh, with kind of the notion of colonialism of course it comes out very clearly in people like Sir robert saudi and others when they write about india in the curse of kihama and so on but even even the the upholders of kind of you know this indian mystique and mystery like jones well um uh, it just really kind of always comes to the colonialist agenda that's what i think i mean well, well well we have all agreed to kind of look at these with a post colonial lens and i know this is not a literary conference or a history conference so well i just rest my case here but i think there's also a comment by mari amaro i think in the chat box where she says that maybe there are other ways quote on quote of sublime perception beyond the enlightenment understanding of it so well okay. Uh, okay and i think we have one question from orito my question is to nishor go uh, about the idea of ethical gaming and in the sense that uh, that uh, when we are gaming ethically uh, are we actually being too very much ethical in the sense that where, for example people were talking about how uh, game plays uh, games have the game ethical uh, uh, aspects built into their game mechanics uh, i was thinking that what uh, does this build building ethics into game mechanics make the player themselves very much very ethical in Uh, in their own sense, in the sense that, uh, for example, there can always be, you know, uh, make countering ethics, uh, ethical gaming itself into a point of, uh, you know, it becomes doesn't it become calculative 
that we are calculating, okay, so these parts are mathematically calculating, I'm calculating these parts as ethical and these parts as non-ethical. Uh, I was thinking about uh, games, for example, where uh, these go in the different aspect, for example, Papers, Please, or Darkest Dungeon, where, you know, being ethical is uh, the way to, uh, is very hard to uh, continue and rather, and in, in, in the sense that, they have subverted this building ethics into the gameplay game mechanics. They have subverted it by making unethical, but then again, legal to some extent, legal quote unquote uh, portions as their ethical groundings. And I, I, that's what I was thinking that does playing games where unethical aspects are built into the game mechanics make game players more unethical or even when we are playing games where ethical aspects are built into the game mechanics make us more ethical in the sense that uh, and at the end we can also you know uh, we are not uh, are we engaging philosophically or uh, uh, introspectively to the ethics or we are just okay so these are the mechanics these are or are we at, uh, approaching them as sort of like a spreadsheet so, okay, so I have to do this, this, and this, so I will get this and that and these things. So that is what I mean, that is exactly what my question is. What would you say in res with respect to uh, the paper you presented uh, about this behavior translating or not? Okay, so, so um, it, uh... I have to like process your question. Um, uh, well, uh, I believe the ethical uh, considerations they come up as in terms of perception, like how you you see the game. It's not necessarily built into the game. At times, it is, uh, as pointed out in case of Assassin's Creed, you cannot kill. Uh, that's an ethical uh, boundary laid out there or in terms of other games like Fallout 4. Uh, it lets you know that uh, this is a problem on terms of morality. Uh, but mo many games uh, don't involve that. But in those cases as well, uh, in those cases in games where the player is provoked towards unethical choices and um, they are left... Uh, without any punishment for that, um, well, it, the perspective matters, like how you see the game, that matters. Uh, and I think there has been a general shift towards this direction in gaming because we haven't been thinking or speaking about this before, but we are doing that now. And game developers are recognizing that, which is why we have uh, actually movies like Free Guy or games like that, we, which... Uh, recognize that but even when they do not the uh, the player can do so or the interpreter can do so can think about it uh, but on the other hand uh, yes uh, I think believe you're speaking about the fact that when these ethical boundaries are laid out the gaming experience sort of uh, gets hampered right I think you're uh, saying something like that so in that case uh, yeah, it is also a drawback that sometimes treats in when it, you put it too much on, uh, like you sort of point it out when the game developers sort of point out that, okay, this is unethical. That takes out you out of the immersive experience of the game. So there's a certain balance between entertainment and ethics that needs to be uh, sort of um, kept to develop a game, which is in that sense, successful. Uh, was I able to uh, answer I, your okay, question? The thing is that I, when I, I wasn't going into entertainment, I was rather going in the other side that, for example, yeah. there are many games which try to, uh, you know, go into the question of, for example, if, if, like, if I give an example, for example, South Park, the game that has been made, mm -hmm. uh, it, there was a controversial uh, choice of, uh, you know, making... Uh, specific ethnicities uh, as difficulty modes. So that was a satirical controversial choice. So, and in fact, they made it obvious, but 
those kinds of things have always been uh, in place in video games uh, in other video games too uh, so i that that is the uh, that is the problematic aspect i am also trying to think that uh, when games go into these aspects i'm not talking about immersion or uh, you know obviously these have immersion if we are taking into real life because it's literally real life uh, are being put into video game uh, logic uh, but i'm it's less about Im entertainment it's more about uh, how it's a, it's a very ambiguous um, land uh, if i'm getting into it uh, because at the end of the day it's at the end of the day it's a role play how how much we are uh, role playing in the sense that uh, we are essentially role playing someone who has some people who are uh, whose identities have been uh, you know oppressed socially so or historically so that's what i was thinking that uh, when we're talking about ethics and thing uh, does uh, this role play mean that we are uh, being you know we are allowing the players to engage it ethically themselves or are they going to go through it as sort of a different obviously as you said correctly pointed it out it's a, a bit, and obviously at the end of the day depends on the player but i was also thinking on part of the developers for free or the people who are making games uh, uh, bringing into consideration these sorts of aspects because these are somewhat problematic in, in that sense because we are essentially you know gamifying oppression in a sense so that is that aspect of it i was thinking while talking about ethics in gaming mm, yeah uh, so yeah mm, i believe we have now arrived at a point where uh, we do not depend upon the game developers anymore to dictate our moral compass so we can actually now critique uh, the gamification of oppression or the gamification of pre prejudices we have arrived at that point uh, um, yeah so that is what i think is very important because we are now having a discussion regarding this uh, that uh, and that means that a player has come independent of the kind of choices and the preferences that the game is dictating uh, that i believe is a very important development uh thank you for the answer sharma i think that's all the time we have for this panel so well i would like to thank everyone who's been here and a special thank you to all our presenters for the wonderful presentations uh this has been a really wonderful and thought provoking session uh and you can see the celebration emojis coming out yes so thank you everyone and uh, we will be uh, now taking a short break a lunch break and after that we have one of our main attractions of the conference is a keynote uh, by mcgent so please do join us again at 2 o'clock indian standard time thank you everyone